thank you, Ian. And it's, yes, it's an absolute pleasure to be here to talk about badminton. Yes, my favorite sport. So my background, well, Ian's alluded to it, but I'm a sports biomechanist as an academic um, there at Loughborough University. But yeah, I also played a little bit of badminton, certainly nowhere near the standard we're seeing at the Worlds, but uh, to a national level is a, probably a fair description. And over the last 20 years, I've worked in a number of sports, be it gymnastics, athletics, tennis, etc. But through this BWF project, I've finally been able to get back to my passion, which is badminton. So what is sports biomechanics? Some of you may have heard of it. Some of you might think it's to do with maths or calculators. But if I had to describe it, then I use mechanics. I use maths to try and explain and understand movement in sport. And I'm looking for things that are important. What are the most important factors in a given movement? So I'm not a coach. And I'm looking at things from different perspectives. So I'm looking at things from a performance point of view. But I could also look at things from an injury point of view. And both are valid. And you can't have one without the other. And overall, my philosophy around this would be, in elite sport, at the very best level, there are some factors that are critical. They all do the same things. Even though everybody looks different, so we tested 55 odd players here at the World Championships, every one of them smashed differently. But everyone has some key components that are the same. If you're gonna produce elite movements and elite performances, there are some things that are critical. And there's other things that aren't so important. Hair color, et cetera, isn't important. They're down to coaching or other factors. They don't matter. So my role as the biomechanist is to try and explain and understand what are those important things, what makes the best the best, and what is the other stuff that isn't quite so important and is down to individual variation. You don't have to copy elite players, but there are things in there that really are critical. So what's available to me as a biomechanist to try and do this, understand and explain? Well, I could measure, as we've done here at the Worlds, what people actually do. And I'm going to give you a different example because I've been working in cricket for over 10 years. So that research has got to the end of the process and I can show you where it gets to, what's the vision and hopefully what we can achieve in badminton. But that's one side of the coin, measuring what people actually do. The other side, it's more mathematical and theoretical. Looking at what's possible, what would happen if, if I was stronger, could I smash the shuttle faster? If I changed my technique, what would happen? What's stopping me perform better? I can use theoretical modeling to answer that. I'm gonna give you a different example, this time from tumbling, to show you that. So we'll start off, not on badminton, but we will get to badminton in due course. So in cricket, fast bowling, it's a nice sport, Bowlers have an easy job. All they have to do is to bowl fast. It's a bit like in badminton, we talked about in the last presentation, some of the guys being the attacking player. Primarily, he's got to smash the shuttle fast. Well, cricket has an equivalent. Well, my environment, my laboratory environment, although I take it out to the court, looks something like this. I've got about 20 cameras there, each of them recording what the person does in a high level of detail. And to do that, I have to stick lots of little reflective markers on them because those cameras pick up those reflective markers. They pick up the reflection of those markers. So here's England's number one fast bowler, Jimmy Anderson, with these reflective markers on. And I can track each of these markers to one or two millimeters during their performance. So we get the bowler to run up and bowl in that environment. He does what he does best. And all I do is record it. So what do I see? I see the markers. I don't see him, I only see those reflections. Then my students, and Idris is here as the one on the current project, have to join up all those dots and then make it look something more human-like. And I can track this movement really accurately. Then what I can do is say work with the coach and say, what you've been working on for the last 12 months, has it made a difference, for example? So I can start to work with the coach and provide them with visual feedback that they find useful. So what do the fastest bowlers do? If I collect data on a range of bowlers, 
What do they all do? What are those factors that are critical? Well, it maybe isn't such a surprise that the better bowlers in the group run up faster. But here at this position in the bowling action, the quicker bowlers, the ones more like on the right, have delayed their bowling arm. Their bowling arm is in a different position at front foot contact. It's less far through the bowling action. We also find the faster bowlers use their trunk more. So they're pulling with their trunk, and they're not pulling their arm. Even though they're bowling, they're not pulling their arm through. So between the picture on the left and the picture on the right, the faster bowlers pull their trunk through more. And the final factor that comes out of an analysis is that the quicker bowlers are more like the one on the right, their front leg is braced. So they're using their run-up speed, bracing their front leg, and the rest of the body's coming over the top. So those four factors on their own across a cohort of elite bowlers where there's a variation in speed across them, how much of that variance in speed do just these four factors predict? If it was perfect, then we'd have the line y equals x. The predicted speed vertically would be the same as what they actually do. Well, of course, I've ignored all other factors like strength, size, and any other technique characteristics, but these four factors on their own explain three quarters of the variance in speed. So these are the critical factors in fast bowling. And so England Cricket have used this information to say what are the characteristics we're naturally looking for in bowlers. These are the ones that make the difference. Without this sort of research, we wouldn't understand that. Well, what's the equivalent in badminton? We'll come on to that. But coaches talk about shapes. Certainly in cricket they do. And here, the bowler on the right is the fastest bowler. He's bowling at 93, 94 miles an hour indoors. The guy on the left is one of the slower bowlers in that cohort. And you can see the technical difference at front foot contact. They've run up and got into this position. But the bowler on the left, on the right, sorry, he's pulled his trunk through and he's left his arm behind him. That shoulder angle is large. The bowler on the left looks like he's pulling his arm through. That shoulder angle is smaller. And this was the key characteristic across everything as a single variable explaining most variance. So we start to understand how things work. But what would it look like in badminton? So to put it all together in a video, the quick bowler on the right, the slower bowler on the left, the bowler on the right has the speed to play for England. The bowler on the left is going to be a counter play. So as a biomechanist, I want to understand and educate. So that's my experimental example. And now on to something more theoretical. But I'll start with an actual performance. Here's a, a top 10 um, national squad gymnast in the UK from a few years ago. He can perform a double layout somersault in gymnastics. But as a biomechanist and as someone who loves performance, I'd like to see him do more. So could he do three somersaults instead of two? If he was stronger, could he do more? If he did something different with his technique, could he do more? These are hard things to do with an elite athlete because you don't want to mess with them. But with a theoretical model, I can do that. So I build a model of that athlete. So I've got a model at the bottom. It's a simulation model. It's like a computer game. But it's based on that person. It's based on that person's strength. It's based on that person's technique. And first of all, I need to show that the model is accurate. So here, I've asked the model to do what the person actually does. And they're in very close agreement. So now I don't need the real person. I can get rid of the real person and say to the model, can you do three somersaults instead of two? Hands up if you think he could. Two hands, OK. I've got two minutes to convince you we can do three somersaults. So I go to the model and I say, find a technique with this person's strength that can do three. Because two and a half is no good. It's going to end in a, a problem. It's going to land on his head. And you only do it once. So instead of two, guess what? Are you counting? How many was that? Three. Hands up if you now believe me. Four more. I'm not doing very well. So I presented this work at international conferences. I did, I did lots of stuff which I haven't got time to show you. Convinced myself that this was really possible. But wasn't. Someone sent me a video. Someone runs up really fast. You'll see this guy. This is someone from Russia from a few years ago. There was someone that recently has done something slightly better. Count how many somersaults are here. 
One, two, three. Three somersaults is just possible. So here's a theoretical prediction. If I did, he's going to get a headache if we do any more. He, hands and knees. So, if you ignore this, three somersaults is just possible. So here's a theoretical prediction using modeling completely on a computer. The computer knows nothing, it only knows the equations. And yes, I can use modeling to predict elite performance. Well, why couldn't we do that in badminton? Wouldn't that be nice? Maybe that's the future. Anyway, something closer to home then. Overhead throwing skills. Cricket fast bowling, baseball pitch, tennis serve, and the badminton smash. Which of those is the fastest? Badminton. Badminton's the fastest, of course it is. But it's not all about speed. We've also got angle that shuttle goes at, and also accuracy is important. We'll talk a bit about accuracy, but it's mainly going to be about speed today. Okay, what are we talking about? Well, cricket fast bowling, 100 miles an hour, 160 kilometers an hour, that's about the limit in fast bowling. Pace is important. It's devastating when they get it right. Baseball pitch, this, he nearly takes this guy's head off. Watch carefully. Fast. Tennis serve. I think they found this. I think this is about the limit. I think this is the world record currently. 264. Get it in at that speed, it's not coming back. And of course, miles, miles quicker, badminton. So this was taken from the IPL. Speed is important. If we can do it well, we'll win. So if I looked though, so this is taken from the Indian Premier League. This was the sort of speeds that the top eight were doing, the girls and the boys. So there is a range. There's quite a lot of boys that are similar. But if I look at the range we had here at the Worlds across those 55 people, we've got about 70 kilometer an hour, 80 kilometer an hour range. They would all love to be able to do 426 or more, but they can't. Why can't they? How can I help understand that? There's more of a tail with the girls. There's not so many girls that Rick can really hit fast. I'm not going to tell you where I am on that speed track. It's down there somewhere. <laughs> so, questions. Why can some smash faster than others? If I was to ask you, come on, give me two things. What would you think it is? Genetics, okay. What do you, but what do you really mean by genetics? Strength, could be strength. Pardon? Lever length, okay. Anything else? Pardon? Contact point, okay. Speed. Any more? Movement efficiency, okay. We could come up with a whole host of them. But I've boiled it down to three for now. I start at the beginning of the week, I had strength and technique down there. And then lots of people wanted to talk about grip as well, so I put it in there as well. There are lots of things that could be influential and make a difference. Another question though, take any of those individuals, is that their best? Could they do any more? Is 426 that guy's limit? How could I as a biomechanist try and understand that? Because if you've got a guy who can smash the shuttle at 350 kilometers an hour and that's his limit, for you as a coach, there is no point trying to get him to do something different. What does optimum look like? Can we coach someone to smash faster? Those are the sort of questions that I want to try and answer as a biomechanist. So, deliberately this isn't a video of a person. Is this optimum for this individual? Could this person smash any faster? He's smashing at 360 kilometers an hour. If you were his coach, is that good enough? Should he use his hips more? Should he do something? You might all have an opinion. But if you're his coach, you've got to make that decision. Or maybe I, as a biomechanist, can help answer that question. But it's not easy. So that resulted in this first BWF project. There's a few things that we had to do technically. It's really hard to track a shuttle. It slows down so fast, by the time it reaches the net, it's probably got a third of the speed it started off with. Where does the shuttle hit on the racket? It's going so quick, everything's happening so fast. 
can we even work that out? And then wanted to look at speed, what are the characteristics, similar to what I showed you in cricket, and also accuracy. Well, we started off on a pretty low budget, so this is my dining hall at Loughborough University. I have a very big dining hall. I'm a warden of a hall of residence, so I have about two, 300 students that go in there, but I can get rid of all those tables and chairs, and I can fit a badminton court in my dining hall. You know where I am Christmas Day? I'm playing badminton with my kids. So we, pulled, we set up our camera system, a bit like I showed you at the beginning, and we recorded jump smashes at 400 hertz. Here's one of the subjects, ready? We've got some tape on the shuttle, and we've got some markers on the racket. The markers on the racket are pieces of tape, so it doesn't really influence what they do. So all the players, I give them a present at the end, they get to spend hours taking the tape off their racket. So here's an example. And these were county to national level players. I'm in there somewhere, but I'm not going to show you my video. So, so nice and easy, jump up give it a good whack. Okay. So what do we see? Just like in the cricket, we only see the markers. Then label it up so we know which each marker is. 3D dot the dot. Sends my students crazy. And then we drop a skeleton on the top of that. So, with all that data, I've got thousands and thousands of data points, I can't use all of it. Or I can, but it's going to take time. So I'm going to pull out what I think are some critical points within the jump smash. And this is open to debate as to what we actually pick out, but this was the start of the 10. So from that, we looked at, well, how far did they flex at the knee and what did they look like in that position? So at the start of the movement, another easy point to identify is the transition from the racket going backwards to the racket going forwards, to the racket lowest point behind the back, and also then where they are at contact. What's that <coughs> shape? Really trying to mirror what we'd done in cricket before. So I mentioned that it was really tough to track and work out what the shuttle was doing. So here, if you're looking from above, looking from above, no, looking from the side, here's the shuttle coming towards the player, and here's the shuttle being hit by the player. And we can fit and work out between images where the point has happened. Where's the actual point of impact? If we do that, we can fit those with curves, we can extrapolate or interpolate between points, we can work out what the velocity of the shuttle is at the point it leaves the racket, so it doesn't matter if the shuttle's deteriorating a little bit, it's all to do with essentially the mass of the shuttle, and also where the shuttle is hit on the racket with some confidence. So we get something like this, a pitch map for a number of smashes. So each of these is for a particular player where each smash hit on the string bed. The three red ones are his fastest three example. Just nothing particularly to take from that other than a typical example. No surprise that the red ones are in the middle. So we process all the data for that range of participants and we pull out at those critical instances some angles within the body. And then we do some maths, some statistics to see what we find. So what did we get? The most important variable for smashing that we found across that group explained half of the variance in speed was the elbow angle at that critical instant when the racket's going between forwards and backwards. Those in the group that had a smaller elbow angle in that position smashed faster. Now, everybody in the cricket, or uh, the badminton world talks about internal rotation. And the way to probably think about this if we've got a smaller elbow angle in that position, when we internally rotate, we get more speed. If our arm, arm is more extended, we internally rotate, we get very little speed. So it starts to make sense. So 
I've pulled out some pictures. Here's at this point in time, the ones who smash fast, can't really see it here, but the elbow angle is perhaps around 90 degrees. I don't know where the optimum is. All I know is that a small angle, probably around 90, seems to be important. And there's some variation there. What else was important? Well, if we add in using the wrist appropriately, and I'm not going to say more than appropriately at this point, because I think there's a link between what the wrist does and what the grip is. Because if you've got a more open grip, I think you'll use more wrist flexion. If you've got a more traditional grip, you'll use more pronation. But the wrist is clearly important, and that gets us up across that cohort of players up to about 70%. And then the length of time for the swing between the start and impact adds, gets us up to almost all the variation. So that's three variables ignoring everything else. That's pretty powerful. This is the strongest correlation we've found across any of the sports we've looked at. So I'm starting, and only starting, to have some confidence that I'm understanding what is really important in the jump smash. Okay, I'm going to try and show you this visually. So here's one of the faster performers. So this is the 3D environment. You can see the smash in. So we can look at this from any angle we like. And so around this spot in time, we can see oops, this elbow angle around 90 degrees. That seems to be the critical factor along with appropriately using the wrist after that. Okay. So this guy is smashing about 370, 380 kilometers an hour. So I'm starting to have an understanding of what's important. So that was half of it for the first project. The other bit was about accuracy, because it's no good smashing if it's going to be a scattergun, unless it is ridiculously quick. So I set up a second data collection, this time with Loughborough students. Loughborough students are pretty good. They win the university championships every year. And went through the same process, and then just picked out a few things about the shuttle. So the speed across a range of trials, how much variation was there in that? How steep were they hitting? So this is below the horizontal, they all hit down. And also, horizontally, what direction were they? Just three simple things we could take straight from the shuttle. So that's for one subject, and we looked at nine of them. Here's the data. So there's some variation in there, and I just picked two out, um, subject five and six, where subject five, lots of variation. So this is standard deviation, quite high, quite erratic but it's got a good top end speed. And then a subject six, a similar speed on average. What do we find? So I started off looking at the elbow angle between the two subjects. That's the most critical factor. So this is time up to impact. This is the point of impact in both graphs. Almost the same. That's all their trials. There's about 18 trials for each subject there. I can't see a difference between subject five and six. They're both very consistent. We see that for all people at a decent skill level. They're very consistent in what they do. Similarly for the wrist. So it isn't variation, it would appear, in what they're doing in terms of their joint angle changes that's explaining the variation afterwards. So I thought a bit more about it. I said, okay, what about where they get in position? The shuttle's not always in the same place. So this is the position looking from above. X is side to side, so if I'm smashing the shuttle to you, it's this way. And Y is the direction they're smashing in. And where is their toe at takeoff as they leave the ground versus where is the shuttle at impact? Well, they're both quite variable. They do move to get into position, but it's not to exact every time. So that's not explaining it. I then looked at where's the shoulder at impact versus the shuttle. So again, X and Y. 
and they are quite consistent now in how far in front of them the shuttle is as it makes contact. So we're getting about 40 centimeters, but some variation this way. But again, quite similar across the two graphs. But what we did find that was distant, so if this is the, the racket and this is the variation, subject five who's more erratic, there's twice as much variance in where the shuttle is hitting on the racket compared to subject six, who is more consistent. So where the shuttle hits on the racket seems to be obviously quite important. Have I been able to understand where that comes from? Is it visual cues and just they're not, you know, some are better at it than others versus in terms of joint angles and changes? So I haven't got to the bottom of that story, but clearly this is an indicator of consistency. And that was the end of this first BWF project. That's where we got to, um, and that was a PhD student of mine, Romandra, who's now graduated. And now we're moving on to the second phase of the project, which was, is with Idris, who's a PhD student, and we're just over a year into that, and I'm just gonna show you where we've got to. So there, now the same, the methodology is the same, but we're now trying to access elite pro players. Players, some of the players we had in the previous study were very good, but none of them were full-time professionals. So the purpose here was to look, get their data, look at differences, male and female, how does it differ, and jump smash between the two. And ideally we're trying to look at, well, different parts of the world. Do we all use the same technique? And the same sort of questions. So to date, and we've got a lot of data now. So 2016, we were at the All England Championships, got data on, I think, 11 participants there, some of them pretty good. Then went to Badminton England and they kindly gave us access to all of their players. So we got that data uh, December 2016. And then we've been here at the Worlds. And we've got data on 55 people here. Same sort of questions. I come back to the biomechanics. So what does this look, look like? Here's the All England Championships. Ian showed me this, this video earlier, or a bit of it. So top 10 singles player. Nice and easy instrumented court, smashing for maximum pace down the middle. Occasionally they hit, they hit the tube. So when I asked you earlier how good was that person's smash on the video, and I didn't tell you who it was, that's who it was. So he's pretty good. Could he do any better though? Then went to the All England, variety of participants here. So from Gabby. See now we put a shuttle machine at the far end. We wanted a more consistent position of the shuttle at the beginning. When we think about variability, we want to ignore, although we had Atu who was top 20 singles player, there was still some variation there. We found the shuttle machine was a bit better. And Marcus. This, this video shows you the tribulations of being a PhD student. So Driz is in the background. If you notice, one tube goes down. He quite quickly put it up, nearly gets hit. But then Marcus managed to, and this one, well, there was that one, he knocks all three down. So Driz has a nightmare. <laughs> not once, but twice. So I'm not going to trust all of this variability data from Marcus, because I think he was going for a Driz more than the tubes. And then, um, then Chris as well. So we've got some good data in there. We've got some elite pros. What do they do? What can we learn from them? And yes, we put it into a visual environment, etc. So then we're here. Here's one of the, I think it's one of the Scottish guys who was over there earlier. I think this was him. So we've got even more slow motion video here. Eventually, so this is 200 hertz video playing every frame normally. So the data we have in the CAN, which is in the processes being analyzed, is there. And we've got a range in data, what can we learn from it? 
what we learn from it is about the youngsters. So here's one of the early guinea pigs in my dining hall. My little one, age 10, having a go. What can we learn from the elite players to help these guys reach their potential? If I could achieve that, then it will all be worthwhile. Guess some questions. How much percentage of the power comes from the rotation of the arm as opposed to the body motion? Say this again, sorry, I didn't hear the beginning of it. What percentage of the power in the jump smash comes from the arm rotation as opposed to the body motion? I think it depends on the skill of the individual. So a lot of it you can generate from the arm, but if we look at the cricket work, which is where I've got the complete analysis, the best bowlers there, it comes from the core. My expectation in badminton and the jump smash is the best ones, it will come from the core. I think the people who are less skilled, that are less coordinated, will produce you know, the 320s, the 330s kilometers an hour just with the arm. So yes, I can stand here and hit hard to a certain extent, but if I want to really get to the top, I'm gonna have to use my core. That would be my feeling. Stefan Lutkamp, Germany. Is there any correlation between the speed and the point of impact over the head of the shuttle? Means how much they're cutting the stroke or? So, slicing. slicing. So, if I look, so I was you now stood behind recording all these videos this last week. Lots of different techniques. Some cutting this way, some, and some hitting through. The people I think that have got a slightly more open grip are using more wrist and are hitting flatter. The people who've got a more, you know, what you say, your normal forehand grip, they're slicing it more. So it's harder to get this right if you've got a normal grip. So I think it's probably an easier skill to be slightly more open, which is why some players like to do it, to hit flat and get the speed and the direction. But I think probably this is clearly very important. You see that on the videos. You know, if you look here, I think I can pull it back up. So if you see from this position, so you see how the racket's gone from that side, turned all the way through and pronated to there. Clearly that's going to be hard to time and get it to go where you want because ultimately it's there, but if you get it a little bit wrong and the racket's angled there or there, it's going to go in the wrong direction. So the people who have a slightly more open grip at impact will make the timing easier, maybe get a cleaner contact but probably, this is clearly very important, this pronation, but it's hard to get it right. That would be my gut feel. Did you uh, find any difference in the uh, string tension of the racket? Th there are, um, and you know, if you take the tennis world, they'd say slack strings, you can hit it harder because you've got a longer time in contact with the racket. I'm not so sure, and I was talking to an expert over in Italy about it. Um, although it may be true, a lot of everyone here has got their strings at 30 plus pounds. They're all tight. And the time of contact is so short, I'm not sure it really makes a difference at that point. Mark, what, uh, what impact do you think the use of the non racket arm? makes. Interesting. So in the cricket world, where I've got more information, you now they talk about pulling it in and holding it there. And if I look at the modeling side, so we've done the mod, so in the cricket world, we've gone beyond the experimental work to now use England to select their top six bowlers each year and we model them like I showed you in the tumbling to look at the limits to performance. And the model every time predicts put the arm up and put this one down. So. Yeah, I do think it's got a, a role. I don't know how important, and I can't quantify it yet, but I'd be very surprised if it's not got an important role to play. Yeah. Hi, Mark. Uh, great presentation. Floats my boat. <laughs> um, I was wondering, how, did you find any correlation between lower limb uh, data set and performance in 
your, your badminton data thus far. Say this again, sorry, first. Uh, any correlation between the lower limb data? The lower limb. Yeah. And, and trunk, if you have it. No, not yet. And I think that's... I, I'm expecting, when I analyse the, the elite professionals, that the core is going to come in there as important. So my expectation is the data we've got at the, the beginning, uh, to date, primarily, is more like the bowler on the left. I'm expecting to see something different with the elite pros. So I'm expecting to see more core, but it's harder to coordinate. So that's what I'm expecting. But I don't know. And, and you'll probably know the data better than me, but certainly in tennis, there's a very high percentage appears to, of, of power production appears to come from the lower quadrant and trunk. Yeah. So it maybe stands to reason. Yeah. And, and again, maybe just another little add-on question. You possibly don't know yet. Obviously, it's an early project. Um, have you noticed any difference between those that jump smash and those that hit predominantly from the ground? Some, someone else has asked me that already today. Can you smash faster if you stood on the ground or if you jump? Well, if I had a ball in my hand, this is my anecdote, and I wanted to throw it as far as possible, I probably wouldn't jump to throw it as far as possible. But it's not just about pace. So the ones who jump are going to smash steeper, and that's equally important. So if it's just pace, I'd be surprised if the optimum isn't standing on the ground. Okay, you might leave the ground if you hit it, but jump smash is different because it's giving you more angle, and that's critical here. That would be my guess. Sure. Can I be cheeky? Is, it, is it, I told you this floats my boat. I don't want to hog the mic. So I'm going to sit down and we'll talk all day. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we should just have a coffee later. Yeah, but absolutely. Could, it might be helpful for me later on. <laughs> Could you go back to your model set there and show a racket side sagittal plane view at... If I can. Yeah. If, if somebody lets you. I don't know if they're going to let me, though. Okay. Fair we can, uh, well, let's have a look at it afterwards. Okay. Yeah, cool. it's all on here. Okay, cool. Okay, are we about done there? Oh, we've got one more. Well, when from Germany. Yeah. Um, would you think that racket, because now um, from different companies, they, uh, they produce different rackets with different uh, flexibilities. Long, uh, well, some of them are for attacking players, some of them are for defensive players. However, yeah. do you think that's just a marketing strategy or would that really impact your smash? I think it makes a difference. Uh, I think it's clear. How much of a difference? Um, yet to know, but my feeling is that many players use a racket that's too stiff for them so that it doesn't bend at all. So, you know, if you look at the elite pros hitting at 400 kilometers an hour, they're putting a lot of force through the racket. Their brackets are very stiff. If you gave that to a county or a national level player that doesn't put the same work through the racket, that racket's going to be too stiff for them, would be my you know, thought. If you, you know, if you can see on here, if I get it in the right place, you can see that the racket obviously bends. What do I expect? If it's the right elasticity for the player, it will recoil by the point of impact. It's no good it staying bent. It's got to come back. So yes, there will be, and I, my expectation would be, oh, I can see you can't, sorry. I thought you forgot it was up there. Um, that for different players, the right racket for their swing type will be dependent on how well it recoils around the point of impact. So there will be a relation. You can get the wrong racket for you, most definitely, or you can get the right racket. Just, just to emphasize.